Okay, thank you, Monty. Well, let me start by just saying that as we enter the third decade of the 21st century, world food production continues to rely on an industrialized system of agriculture that's been in place since the 1960s. This system is best known for escalating cereal yield. But there is growing concern over a wide array of unintended consequences. My story this afternoon is about one of those consequences, impacting the soil resource that is foundational to agricultural sustainability. It's a story I was never taught in any class I ever took. I had to discover it in collaboration with Saeed Khan, who spoke at this conference a year ago on the subject of potassium, and also Tim Ellsworth, who these days lives in California he farms not too far from here and teaches at the West Hills College in Coalinga. I also need to acknowledge Charlie Bost, who was a co-author on one of our papers, and Susanna Reff, who helped us with statistics for data analysis. The industrialized system of agriculture that we have in place today would never have happened without the industrial synthesis of ammonia. In his book, Enriching the Earth, the geographer Yaklov Schmiel from the University of Manitoba comes to the conclusion that ammonia synthesis was more important than any other technological advance of the 20th century because it was the one that set the stage for world population to increase to its present level. I don't take exception to Schmiel's conclusion, but I do question his title. And you may too by the end of this talk. The synthesis of ammonia seems to be such a simple process. One part of N2 gas reacts with three parts of hydrogen to make two parts of ammonia. It would be simple, except for the fact that Keith just mentioned in his talk that N2 is such a stable molecule. It's the most stable diatomic molecule in nature, and that's why it makes up 78% of air. In order to break the triple bond that holds the two atoms together, you have to use a high temperature, a high pressure, and the right catalyst. Efforts to synthesize ammonia got their start in the 19th century, but no real progress was made until July 2nd of 1909. That's the day that, that Fritz Haber, a young assistant professor at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany, gave a demonstration to a group from BASF which had been funding his research. In that demonstration, Haber successfully made a small amount of ammonia. And BASF was so impressed that the next day, they canceled their plans for a major investment for the electric arc process in Norway. They had seen the future of the nitrogen industry in Haber's lab. <clears throat> 
But they were faced with a bit of a challenge in turning a lab demonstration into an industry. They assembled a very, a very highly skilled team of chemists and engineers to take on that task. And it was led by Carl Bosch. By 1910, they were making progress toward overcoming some of the many obstacles they had to face. And three years later, the first ammonia plant came on stream at Oppau in Germany. The initial plans for that plant and for those that followed were to produce ammonium sulfate as a fertilizer. But the events of August 1914 and the ensuing war changed all that. So that the production was redirected toward trinitrotoluene, better known as TNT. Now during World War I, Germany was the only nation to have ammonia synthesis. And it's estimated that if they had not had it, World War I would have ended by December of 1914 when the Germans would have run out of artillery shells. But they could keep making the shells because they had the Haber-Bosch process. The Allies also needed TNT, but they made theirs by using Chilean nitrate of soda as the nitrogen source. How ironic it is that this tremendous advance, which was intended to increase food production, ended up costing the lives of untold millions in World War I and of many more millions in World War II when all the belligerents had access to ammonia synthesis. When the hostilities ended in 1945, the munition plants needed a market. And so they naturally looked to going back to producing fertilizer with the ammonia they were making. In the US, into the 1950s, the traditional use of legume rotations was still in practice. Corn was commonly grown following a forage legume such as clover or alfalfa. But by the 1960s, the white tanks were beginning to show up. And for the first time, farmers could now buy their nitrogen instead of growing it. The result was a profound change to continuous cash grain cropping that changed the agricultural landscape of Illinois and the Midwest. So began the modern era of Illinois corn production. It reflects one of the great success stories in American agriculture. And that success is documented by statewide average yields that show a progressive increase over the years in corn yields, except in cases of bad weather. The net effect is that on the same land that grew 50 bushels per acre in 1950, we now grow over 200. Now that increase has come about partly because of better genetics, higher plant populations, and more effective methods of controlling weeds, insects, and diseases. But there's no doubt it's also due to nitrogen fertilizer. We might wonder how much of it is due to nitrogen fertilizer. And to help us get a little better handle on that, this next figure shows two data sets. One showing the average annual input 
of fertilizer in in Illinois, and the other, grain in removal, which is calculated from crop yield. As we've said, the tremendous increase in nitrogen fertilizer usage took place beginning in the 1960s. And that increase continued into the 1980s, at which point the input of fertilizer in was over double grain in removal. That led to a gap, and the gap is actually far worse than indicated here because as we pointed out yesterday, the soil is the major source of N for crop uptake, not the fertilizer. Now we might note that in more recent decades there's been a plateauing or even something of a decline in fertilizer N usage, while the grain removal or yield has continued on its upward course interrupted by years with bad weather. And so if the yield has been climbing while the N has been stagnating or declining, we might get the idea that there's a second source of N that feeds the crop. And as we talked about yesterday, there certainly is, and it's the soil. And in this next slide, we find out once again that the soil is the dominant end source. Here we're looking at yield data coming from 47 on-farm response trials that did not receive manure or any other source of fertilizer except 28% that was side dressed. Eleven of the 47 data sets show only a green bar, and the green bar indicates the check plot yield. So 11 of those sites had no blue bar, which would be the increase in yield from end fertilizer at the economically optimum end rate. I've arranged the check yields, the green bars, in order of decreasing from left to right. And as you look at the blue bars, you might notice a tendency for them to get higher on the right and lower on the left. And that once again in indicates the point we made yesterday that poor soils need more fertilizer and good soils need less. Now for this data set as a whole, the optimum end rate averaged 85 pounds per acre and that gave an average yield increase of 42 bushels per acre. Now, of course, these days, most corn growers use a lot more than 85 pounds per acre. And the textbooks would tell us that's a good thing because nitrogen fertilizers build soil organic matter by increasing the input of residues and by supplying one of the constituent elements that makes up organic matter, which would be nitrogen. If those textbooks are correct, then the soils of Illinois and elsewhere throughout the Midwest should be better than they used to be in a lot of properties that have a lot to do with growing plants because organic matter improves soil aggregation and aeration. It helps the soil hold more water. It builds cation exchange and buffer capacities, and it supplies mineralizable NPNS and many of the micronutrients. There's plenty of evidence that nitrogen fertilizers do build organic matter, such as this data set coming from a site in western Illinois that we mentioned yesterday. Static plots under continuous corn at Monmouth. In this figure, we're looking at a plot of soil organic carbon sequestration on the y-axis and fertilizer end rate on the x. There are two data sets. The lower one represents sampling to the surface foot 
and the upper one sampling down to three feet. In both cases, there's a positive slope indicating that a higher end rate increased soil organic carbon. Now, before we get too excited about that finding, I would direct your attention to the fact that there are no data points for the zero end rate treatment. And that's because these data points are differences for the fertilized versus the check. When they were all sampled at the same time in 2004. There's an implicit assumption there that the check plot was constant in organic matter over time. And that assumption is not valid. As we said yesterday, the check plot loses yield when it's mined of fertility with no inputs. And so over time, the input of residue carbon declines. And so does the organic carbon in the soil. And so it's possible that even though these fertilized plots had higher levels of organic carbon than the check at the time they were all sampled, it's possible that the fertilized plots might have lost carbon over time, which is the only thing that matters. Comparing treatments means nothing here. It's about changes over time. Well, as a matter of fact, that is precisely what happened. Because we happen to have a second data set for the same set of plots, but it came from a soil sampling 10 years earlier in 1994. And when averaged over the set of treatments, we find out that the soil carbon declined by over two tons per acre in the surface four inches. Well, maybe the problem is that 10 years just isn't enough time for nitrogen fertilizers to build soil organic matter. Maybe we need more time. In that case, I'm working at the right institution. <laughs> the moral plot is not only America's oldest experiment field, it's the oldest experiment field in this hemisphere. It was established in 1876. It occupies about seven-tenths of an acre. And in 1968, it was designated a National Historic Landmark, largely through the efforts of my former advisor, Toby Kurtz. Toby's effort paid off very nicely because as a National Historic Landmark, the land is protected. And I do know what universities tend to do, and that is to build parking lots or buildings to make a few more bucks. But they can't touch this one. It's still there, and it's going to stay. And over the years, the soil becomes a record of how it's been treated. And the data just accumulates. So as you can see, this site supports three different rotations. We go from the north side with continuous corn to the center with what is now corn soybeans, but used to be corn oats before 1967. And then in the south end, we have corn oats and alfalfa hay. Beginning in 1955, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in the form of urea was brought onto the plots to fertilize some of the subplots on the west western half of the experimental area, whenever corn was grown. The next spring, an article was carried in a fertilizer trade magazine called Plant Food Review. 
It was authored by the guy who was at that time the head of the Department of Agronomy, M.B. Russell. The title, you might note, was all the way back in one year. And it's telling the good news that yields have been substantially increased by NPK. And here I need to note that when the NPK plots were established in 1955, they did so by splitting the plots that had previously been the check. Back to 1876. And so here we are looking at these baskets of corn, and the one for the NPK that used to be a check is now much higher than the one that is still a check. All the way back in one year. But there is a question mark at the end of the title, and there should have been. And here we need to note that there's more to agricultural sustainability than yield. Well, the good news continued to come. In 1982, this publication was put out, The Moral Plots, A Century of Learning. And in it, we have a series of figures plotting changes over time, and this one shows organic matter. It's for continuous corn, and I would direct your attention to the lowest data set in the figure, this one right here. That's the change in organic matter over time for the check plot. And to no one's surprise, it's going down because that plot's being mined of fertility. It's a static plot. It's being mined. But the interesting thing comes over here in the line that I've circled in red. Beginning in 1955, that's the year the nitrogen came into the moral plots. There's this straight line increase in organic matter. And that's getting at the issue of nitrogen fertilizer building organic matter. Looks like it does from the figure. So let's just extrapolate that out about 51 years to the year we resampled in 2005. And we would expect to find a buildup of some 12 tons of organic matter or 7 tons of organic carbon per acre. Okay? Buildup. Now we get to the heart of the message. And I, uh, <laughs> the key line here is where is the buildup? It, it goes back to an old Wendy's commercial. Where's the beef? Remember that one years ago? Criticizing their competitors with a small patty on a big bun. Okay? Where's the beef? We're asking where's the buildup? So we're going to look at a series of bar charts. This is the first for continuous corn. And our experimental period is from 1955 to 2005. 51 years. In this case, let's start with the two photos on the right side of the figure. They're just showing the residue cover after harvest. Okay. So the NPK treatment, it, it, it had 32,000 plants per acre when I took that photo. And it was so completely covered with residue that you couldn't even see the soil. It's loaded with stover. And next to it, on the check, well, we had 8,000 plants per acre back in 2005. The plants didn't grow very well. They weren't very tall. And there wasn't much residue, and you could easily see the soil. And so I've walked by the moral plots <laughs> more times than I care to remember. And I'd always assumed, well, with this kind of difference, the soil carbon must be greater in the fertilized and in the check. It must be. The green bars substantiate the difference in carbon inputs. 
That's the residue carbon input over 51 years. And it's about three times higher for the NPK than it was for the check. But the orange bar tells a different story. That's the soil carbon storage down to 18 inches. And to get those numbers, we are taking the differences from the archival samples that had been stored from 1955 and then the new samples collected in 2005. I ran the analyses myself. I wasn't about to trust this to a technician. And so what we find is that there was a small increase in organic carbon in the check plot over those years, but not in the NPK. It was slightly down. Very interesting. We put in three times as much carbon and you'd never find it in the soil. The soil couldn't hold it. It's gone. Okay? And it took some of the soil's native organic carbon with it. Corn soybean. Similar story. This time we have about twice as much residue carbon input over those 51 years. And now we find out from the orange bars that both the check and the NPK lost carbon. It's gone. Yes, this was corn oats until 1967, but we factored that into our budget, okay, in terms of the residue carbon inputs. So it's losing, like the continuous corn. Now, what about nitrogen? Nitrogen occurs largely in organic matter in soils. So we'd expect to see a parallel change between nitrogen and carbon. So what we're doing here is plotting the, plotting the input of fertilizer over the 51 years in the green bar. The blue is the crop end removal and the orange yellow is the soil end storage. For the check treatment, there was no input of fertilizer in, so we only have two bars. We took out about one ton per acre over the course of those years, and the soil lost nitrogen. Hardly a surprise. We're mining and losing. But what about the NPK? We put in almost five tons cumulative over the 51 years, about twice as much in was applied as was removed, and the soil lost even more total nitrogen. Now that goes against one of the things I was taught when I took soil fertility by a guy named Fred Welch. Now, I shouldn't be so hard on Fred, but he told us, you put on extra fertilizer, you build up the soil's nitrogen. Hogwash. It's burned away. No buildup. So we're still looking for the buildup and we haven't found it yet. We go to corn soybean. We aren't going to find it there either. This time we have a little bit of a confounding in terms of crop in removal because this rotation includes a legume. And some of the end that I plot here is removal came from the air, not the soil. But that, that's not a big deal. The main issues are the fertilizer input and the soil storage. And again, the check lost and so did the NPK. It's not holding it. So we're putting these inputs in, but, but we're not keeping it. We're losing. No buildup. Let's go to the most important fraction of soil nitrogen when it comes to growing plants, the part that mineralizes and feeds the plant. 
A fraction that I mentioned yesterday with the Illinois Soil End Test, or ISNT, and we used it here to compare levels from 1955 and 2005 soil samples for all three rotations in the Morrow plots, but only for the fertilized plots, NPK. And what we find in all three cases is that the 2005 levels are lower than they were in 1955. And so what we've done here is we've made a poorer soil. <laughs> That's what we've done. And you might notice that the decrease was smallest with the corn oats hay and largest with continuous corn. And there I would just point out that the nitrogen input from synthetic N is, a, is the smallest for corn, oats, hay. Happens once every three years, effectively. There's a little bit for oats, but not much. And here, it's largest. Happens every year. And you might notice as well about the depth increments. We plot them here with different colors. And in several cases, we found that the greatest burning effect was happening in the subsoil, not the surface. It stays moister and the microbes stay more active with more inputs of root material, as Keith talked about in his presentation. So no, we're not finding much buildup here. So we began to ask the question, well, is this something unique to the moral plots or can we find it more widely? So we went to the library. That's a dangerous thing to do. And there we found a lot of data from different long-term experiments. I'm going to show you data from four of those sites. There were many, many more. Let's begin with the world's oldest cropping experiment at Rothamsted near London, England. There, the best known study is called the Broadbach Continuous Wheat Study. And this site dates back to 1842, when it was started by Sir John Bennett Laws, who founded the fertilizer industry with his patent for superphosphate. This is Rothamsted. And here we're looking at a time series covering about 140 years. And it's comparing farmyard manure with NPK with the unmanured or check treatment. For the check, we're losing organic carbon. Not surprising, we're mining the soil. Big deal. But for NPK, well, here I need to note something. The Rothamsted guys want to put the best face possible on how fertilizer is doing. Remember, it's the home of the fertilizer industry. That's important. So they put a little bit of an upward twist here at the end of the NPK plot, but my advice to you is ignore it and go for the points instead. So we put this red trend line and the slope is negative. You're not building with NPK. And that was with 144 kilograms per hectare, which is about 120 pounds per acre. But farmyard manure, oh yes, it's a buildup, big time. Those effects show up in the box in the upper left-hand corner where we look at total N over a little over 100 years. Farmyard manure, big buildup, NPK, some loss. Yes? What's the depth of sampling on that one? Nine inches, nine inches. Okay, so we're looking for buildup. We don't find it at Rothamsted. Let's go to Denmark. Ascoff, Denmark. Here we have two soils represented by their experimental plots. One's a loam, one's a sand. And both are under the same rotation. That includes wheat, a root crop, barley, and a mixed grass, forage, clover, 
for it. Okay, we're looking at about 70 years of data here. And the three treatments are the same, uh, by name at least, as at Rothamsted. We have the farmyard manure. We have NPK at an average of 70 kgn per hectare um, per year. And we have the untreated check. And if we look at the data points or the lines, we see they're all going down in humus or organic matter. They're losing. And there's some indication that the sand is losing more than the loam. So we go to the box with the nitrogen data, about 50 years there, and we find out they're all losing. And we note that the NPK looks like it's losing a bit more than the farmyard manure. And here I need to make the comment, why is farmyard manure losing here when it built up at Rothamsted? It's because their manure rate was much lower than at Rothamsted. Yeah. So no buildup at, at Ascoff. Let's go uh, over to Dairain, France. The Dairain plots in Grignan. White sugar beet. We have about 20 years of data here. We're plotting changes in organic carbon and total nitrogen over time for the check and the NPK treatment with about 78 pounds per acre annually. And we note first that it's decreasing in both parameters. We're losing. And secondly, notice how the NPK treatment runs right together with the check. You can hardly separate them. Now, the NPK would have given higher yields, but it does not show up in the soil. It's not there. No buildup in France. So let's come back to the U.S. and take a stop at Sanborn Field. The second oldest site in the U.S. started in 1888. But, in my opinion, the guys at Sanborn and University of Missouri were a little bit more farsighted than those at the Morrill Plots because from the very first year, they included a treatment with synthetic nitrogen. It was ammonium sulfate. They have different crop rotations at Sanborn Field, but this is continuous wheat. And what we're looking at here is a comparison between 1914, well, let's see, that was the 25th year after they started the plots. And then 1938 was the 50th year after they started the plot. And we're comparing organic carbon and total nitrogen changes for the check and the NPK with this rate of N. And lo and behold, the check went up in carbon and the NPK started lower and went down. In total nitrogen, they both lost. But the NPK started lower. And so an interesting fact comes out of this. And that's the guy who did the study, William Albrecht. This guy had four degrees from the place where I work. He went to Missouri and spent his career there, and for many of his years, he was the chair of the Department of Agronomy. In 1938, he published two articles pertinent to this topic. The first came out in the USDA Yearbook of Agriculture, Soils and Men. And in that article, he gives the usual textbook message that you need adequate nitrogen to build soil organic matter. Then he went to Sanborn Field, pulled these samples in 1938, compared them to 1914, <laughs> and completely changed his position. Now he says that the plots with the lowest organic matter content are the NPK treatment. And he says there, 
the carbon has been extensively burned out. And as a credit to his integrity, never again did he publish the message that nitrogen fertilizers build soil organic matter. It all changed here. Now this burning that Albrecht is telling us about is fundamental to life on planet Earth. Most of the microbes that live in soils need organic carbon to make energy. They're heterotrophs. And in order to use that carbon, they have to make the enzymes to process it. And every enzyme contains nitrogen. Every one. So there's the tie between nitrogen and carbon. The rationale for C-DAN ratios. It's right there. So when microbes are given a good dose of corn stover, they want nothing more than nitrogen to build the enzymes and burn the carbon. And on the other hand, when they're given a nice dose of anhydrous ammonia and no residue, they need to find some carbon. And they'll find it in the organic matter. So there it is. The, the paradigm is you give microbes in, they want C, you give them carbon, they want N. It's always that way. Now sometimes you can put that principle to good practice. Such as when you have a tree stump that you'd like to get rid of and you're too cheap to buy a stump grinder. So why don't you try burning it? Well, you can burn it, but there's a different way to burn it. Here we see a guy who's drilling the stump out and he's going to put in something called stump remover. Well, it turns out, it's nothing more than nitrogen fertilizer. Potassium nitrate, usually. And what's going to happen is when you give the microbes nitrogen and keep the, keep the hole somewhat moist, you're, you're going to cause the microbes to attack the wood. And they're going to rot it and remove that stump for you. I wanted to demonstrate this one year to introductory soils. I didn't have a tree stump handy, so what I did was cut up a couple pieces off a pine 2x4, milled some slots in them, and put some soil in there as an inoculum. One of the pieces got treated as well with calcium nitrate, and the other one not. Then I just watered them occasionally, left them sitting in the lab. And after about six weeks, I took these, this photo. And the one that had been fertilized within was now covered with fungal colonies, and the other one hardly had any. <laughs> Give them nitrogen. They attack the wood. They rot out the wood. Another good place to use that principle is when you need to clean up an oil spill. Back in 1989, there was a little bit of an oil spill up in Prince William Sound, Alaska. The Exxon Valdez had kind of run aground that night, dumped 11 million gallons of crude, and they were kind of desperate to get rid of it. So one of the things they tried was fertilizer. It was a mixture of urea and a phosphorus-based surfactant. And here's one of the papers that reports the results from that. And in this rectangular light-shaded area, it had had crude oil, the black stuff, and now it was all gone. <laughs> they gave the microbes in, and the microbes burned the oil, took out the carbon. It's called bioremediation and it's been used for the same purpose since then in other spills. Now we come back to the moral plots. This microbial effect. The big one that matters depletes soil productivity. Let's take on that topic with this bar chart comparing the check and the NPK for two of the rotations Continuous corn and corn oats hay. We're plotting corn yield, residue carbon inputs, and fertilizer and applied. 
And for the Czech treatment, it's hardly a new story. We find out from the, the orange bar that the yield for corn was about twice what it was for continuous corn. And I should tell you here that the yield data I'm plotting are the average of those years when corn was grown on both rotations between 1955 and 2005. So it's about double for the corn oats hay rotation, and what's the surprise? That's the old system of agriculture. Corn was grown after a forage legume. The legume enriched the soil. No, the message here is found on the right side. It's the NPK treatment. So now we look at the nitrogen inputs for corn oats hay versus continuous corn, and oh my, we see about three times as much for continuous corn. Got fertilized every year. Corn oats hay every third year. The residue carbon inputs are also greater for continuous corn than for corn oats hay, partly because of the hay year when they harvested the above ground biomass. So we see more nitrogen and more carbon going in to the continuous corn, and then we look at the yield. And the yield is higher for corn oats hay than for continuous corn. Now how about that? You put more in and you get less out. That's a deal. It illustrates a principle that used to be taught. And that is that fertilizers don't replace crop rotation. They sure didn't hear. Corn oats hay out yielded continuous corn. But if, if the bar charts are just not quite to your liking, let's just go to the photos. Here we are in 2006 in a dry summer in Urbana. And we're comparing those same two rotations, continuous corn and corn oats hay, the fertilized plots. Same student in both photos, and I'm, I didn't do any photoshopping here. No tricky stuff. These are straight. And look at this. In the, in the continuous corn, the student is about the same height as the corn. It wasn't doing very well. Down on the corn oats hay to the south side, oh yes, the corn was way taller, darker green, and you have to know the yield would put that to shame. And why? Well, of course, it was a dry summer. And one of the functions of organic matter is to store water. And so we had a soil down here with more organic matter, and the corn knew it. It took up more water. <laughs> OK, so where are we? We've been looking for a buildup. We never did find one. And we have a problem, a dilemma. We built this food production system on an artificial foundation. It's not natural, it's artificial. It has inflated cereal yields, and it has more than doubled world population. But there's storm clouds in the West. It's made the soil weaker by promoting the loss of organic matter. Now, the folks at National Geographic apparently were beginning to worry about this back in 2008 when they put out an issue with the message, Where Food Begins. And they were worried about soil degradation from things like salinization. Well, I think there might be a bigger issue at stake here. We're burning our soils and we're setting the stage for the train to run off the bridge that's out. Food shortages. There have been reports of food shortages, especially in some parts of Asia. 
and especially in India, it seems they've had to escalate the fertilizer end rates over the years just to maintain productivity. It's because the soil's getting weaker. So it begs the question, what can be done? I'm going to give you three suggestions for the short term, and then we'll just give an overview for the long term strategy. In the short term, we need to find ways to improve fertilizer and uptake efficiency. If we can put more of the fertilizer in in the crop, there will be less left in the soil to stimulate microbial decomposition of carbon. One way of doing that is the one that I mentioned yesterday, to account for the soils in supplying power. Here in the photo, Tim Smith is in his first sampling pickup that he's going to use for grid sampling with the Illinois soil end test. That works in Illinois and other humid areas, but in drier climates, it's more a question of profile nitrate storage. So we need to be targeting the right form of N to assess the soil's supplying power. The second idea is to improve the application timing. Now in Illinois and other areas of the Midwest, there's always this temptation for farmers in the fall that they might want to fall fertilize with anhydrous. The industry promotes it. It does have some economic advantages in some years. But, well, we just need to say it, the main motive is convenience. We need to put more emphasis on crop end need. Does it make sense to apply this very dynamic nutrient six months before the crop can take it up. It won't be six months before the microbes take it up. They're waiting. And when you give them residues and ammonia, they could hardly be happier. So what if we transitioned to an in-season approach with side dressing and that's becoming a lot more feasible these days with systems like the Y-Drop from 360 Yield Center. Urea ammonium nitrate is placed next to the crop row when the crop needs it. It's bound to be more efficient than this. The third idea is to consider changing the form of fertilizer in. We talked about the Haber-Bosch process, and because of that process, ammonia dominates the fertilizer industry. Ammoniacal fertilizers are the norm. But what about nitrate? It's been known for a long time that soil microbes prefer ammonium to nitrate, whereas the plant is more competitive for nitrate uptake. Here we have an N15 study conducted in Montana with wheat, and it perfectly illustrates that principle. It's comparing two parameters for sodium nitrate versus two ammoniacal sources, urea and urea plus a urease inhibitor and BPT. In terms of the plant uptake, in the upper figure here, we have fertilizer end uptake efficiency, and the nitrate source was significantly higher than the ammoniacal. And in the lower figure, we have the soil end of it, and there, the nitrate source was significantly lower than the ammoniacal. The nitrate put more in the plant and left less in the soil. Precisely what we should want to do. And then we come to the long-term 
strategy. This gets to be tough, and you guys know that better than me. Diversify agriculture. Implement strategies to reduce our need for synthetic nitrogen. And that means legume-based rotations. And I don't mean grain legumes, I mean forage. Things like red clover in this photo. And that runs into a host of problems that you guys know far better than me. How do you design a practical system to do that that will bring in income and provide a market for those kind of crops in this modern age? Back 100 years ago, when that was the norm, we had horses in the field. Now we don't. So there's some huge problems in making that practical. But in the long run, we may have to shift in that direction. And with your discussions on regenerative agriculture, I think you've gotten a running start if we need to go in that direction. So I will conclude with an inscription that was discovered in a cave in northern India. It's a warning from 3,500 years ago about the importance of soil stewardship to human survival. And it still applies in the modern age of industrialized agriculture. That's my story.